Institute of Military Technology, located on Florida's Space Coast, specializes in the history and evolution of small arms design. The museum is home to original designs by Eugene Stoner, the father of the M16. Hello, I'm Reed Knight. We're here today at the Institute of Military Technology. Here at the Institute of Military Technology, we have gone all the way back to 1776. We immediately had some very early wars, the Revolutionary War, and we had the flint locks that we basically had to buy from other countries because we had no factories here. As we progressed through that, we basically built our own factories to build our own weapons and to advance our own technology. From that period of time, today we are still one of the most well-equipped militaries in the world. The legendary John Garand foresaw the future in small arms design beyond the M1 rifle. We should develop a lighter rifle with the available lighter ammunition that we have now, an alloy, steel, better knowledge. It should be a nice project for the younger generations to tackle and furnish our infantry with the best rifle in the world. Eugene Stoner developed the prototype for the gas impingement system while working in his garage in 1953. This gas system would go on to be used in the M16 rifle. One of my mentors was Gene Stoner. Gene Stoner was a, a friend and a source of education. Gene Stoner was the inventor of the AR-10 and the AR-15 rifles. That design, even though it looked a little far out for the, that time in, in history, uh, didn't look too conventional. At least it was easier to handle in full automatic fire, which was a requirement at that time. And uh, generally the mechanism was simpler with this type of gas system and all that. We'd pretty well prove that all out in the AR-10. By the time the 15 came along, that's how the 15 really got started. Well, they, they gave us a contract then to, to build, I think, about 12 or 15 weapons, and I took them down to Fort Benning, and that's the first place they were tested by the Army under the auspices of the infantry board. The AR-15 later became known as the M16 rifle. The M16 rifle was adopted by the U.S. Army in 1964. The M16 had problems when it was first adopted in Vietnam for many different reasons. For instance, the Army didn't furnish any training manuals. They didn't even have a, a bore brush or cleaning rod for these weapons, and they issued 85,000 of them. It was a very sad thing happened was the fact that the Army then took over the task of coming up with a tech data package for the ammunition, and they did and they specified rather loosely what they, what they really wanted. And uh, that turned out to be a very bad situation because what they did do is they specified, for instance, muzzle velocity and chamber pressure and nothing else, which meant that the gas port pressure, where the pressure's tapped off to operate the mechanism, wasn't even specified in the, in the uh, tech data package. So the Army then uh, allowed this to happen and the ammunition that started coming down the supply line to meet the Army requirements was really loaded with a different propellant than what we ever used in the weapons before that. It was, namely it was a ball propellant rather than the IMR propellant. In this case the weapon was designed and the gas port was established to operate a certain 
gas port pressure to operate the mechanism. And by going to the ball propellant, the first thing that happened, it increased the pressure considerably, therefore ran the firing rate of the weapon up. I mean, not just a little bit, but quite a bit. In other words, up in the neighborhood of two and 300 rounds a minute more. That in itself was a problem, but timing is everything, <laughs> and Murphy's Law prevails. And at this time that this happened, that this propellant was introduced to the troops and was almost the only propellant available, is when these troops start going overseas that were trained with another rifle and suddenly given this new rifle with no equipment, no training manuals or anything, just said, go get them, fellas. And they, at the same time, got this propellant that was making the weapon malfunction, firing too fast, doing a lot of other things. It became really almost a disaster because they had weapons completely failing in firefights. Uh, it just became a real mess. It became really the target of a congressional investigation. This rifle had never been tested with that type of propellant. All the millions and millions of rounds we'd fired had all been done with an IMR propellant as the known, and then suddenly, without any, uh, you might say, really uh, field tests of any magnitude, they introduced this thing into a wartime situation. And either the lack of training or the propellant change could have probably been tolerated, but not altogether. In other words, when you put the lack of training, lack of maintenance equipment, and the new propellant, or them into the same situation all at one time, that's what caused the big problem. After the problems that existed in Vietnam were addressed. When Westmoreland went over to survey, I think, for Kennedy, uh, what they really needed over there, you know, to help them out after they were committed to combat, and the, uh, the answer was, we need more AR-15 rifles. And Westmoreland came back, told the president, and the president, I guess, got on the phone, and there was literally an open-ended contract made verbally with Colt to start producing. Today, some 60 years later, the M16 rifle has become the longest living battle rifle the United States has ever adopted. Gene Stoner, at the young age of 35 years old, designed and created his idea of a gas impingement system using small parts, using lightweight parts, advanced alloys such as aluminum and such as fiberglass to build a weapon system that had never been invented before that time. My aircraft uh, background experience uh, allowed me to get into some of these lightweight materials. For instance, uh, forged uh, aluminum receivers, which are rather unknown at the time and in, uh, in weapons. But it was nothing particularly new to what I've been doing all along in the aircraft equipment and the fiberglass and all that. They were more or less materials that I'd been using all along, but weren't very well accepted or used in the, uh, in the gun business. One thing for sure, even a lot of people try it, we haven't managed to change the laws of physics very much. And so therefore, the things that are really left to play with and to, you might say, improve on or change are the materials that are available that come along. Every time there's a new material, it may fit something that, uh, and allow you to do something that you couldn't do before because the material wasn't available. Or even finishes can make quite a difference. And then you take that with new machining techniques or fabrication techniques. Uh, there's in the last, uh, you know, since the M16 was designed, or even this weapon's designed, there's a whole, there's a whole new technology there on uh, manufacturing. That's the reason, like on this last design, I was favoring the NC type machine because that really is a universal machine. Stoner designed this weapon and advanced it as he went on through his career. If you think about that, John Garand took 30 years to design and adopt the semi-automatic rifle called the M1 Garand. 
Gene Stoner, he only had a few years to develop it and it was immediately a success and partially because of the lightweight and the future technology of small caliber high velocity, which means that a small projectile at a very high velocity, at that time 3,200 feet per second, stored a lot of kinetic energy when it tumbled as it hit the target. The uh, impulse or the amount of recoil is considerably less on the smaller weapon so therefore in, a, in automatic fire the accuracy can go considerably higher than the uh, the 30 caliber and there are uh, some other subtle things that come up too the uh, basically the uh, wounding capability of a small caliber is not disproportionate to the large caliber weapon there in most practical cases are almost identical because of the velocity difference in the lightweight bullet. That technology has been used to go further into making a lightweight family of weapons. Today our belt-fed machine guns use a 5.56. All of our NATO countries use a weapon like that. And a lot of the Comlock countries use a very similar cartridge. Well, first of all, I have to start with what you're trying to fire, okay. which was, and I designed up this, I considered the lightest weight bullet that would do the job, which meant that it would require the smallest and lightest cartridge case. So that's how this 5.56 uh, uh, round came into existence. The uh, 222 was rather an obvious choice. It didn't take much figuring to figure that out. Yeah, the 222 was a Remington sporting cartridge, right? Yeah, it was a standard round. And it looked like what it really needed was a military bullet. So I designed up a bullet, went over to uh, Sierra Cartridge, our bullet company in uh, close by in Whittier, California, and they said, sure, we'll build you one. So they took my prints and built up a bullet. And we took it out, loaded it up, and uh, fired it in a conventional rifle and found out it would do just about everything that they were asking for. Fact is, we were able to accomplish everything they were asking for. So then we went to Remington and Winchester and asked them for quotes of loading this bullet up into commercial cases. Well, they did, but then they hesitated on delivering any because what happened was that we were getting the pressures up a little higher than they liked. So they came back with a bullet with a, I mean a cartridge with a slightly larger chamber size. That alleviated getting the pressures up higher. They could put a little more propellant in and a little different type, slower burning, and, and get the velocities that I was asking for to get the penetration. I mean, that was the main criteria of the velocity at the time was to get penetration of a steel helmet at 500 yards and uh, also uh, go through 10 gauge steel plate at 500 yards. So that kind of determined that and I said, well, I have no objection of going away from the standard cartridge case if that's what you want to do. So they did and that became the 223 Remington as an identifier so it wouldn't get mixed up if somebody in the marketplace, although they had no intentions of ever commercially building it. Stoner was an interesting man. He was very shy. He was very reserved. He was opinionated. A lot of his opinions were all based on actual events and actual things that happened to him during his uh, lifetime. I remember one day we were in England, one of the designers of the British rifle, the L85. They brought the gun in and they laid it out on the table. They looked at it and they took it all apart and they showed Mr. Stoner and they looked at him and said, well, Mr. Stoner, what do you think of our rifle? And Stoner looked back at him and he said, you know, what is there not to like about your own children? So basically threw it right back at them that they had copied his design. Here you'll get to see some of the stuff that Gene Stoner did at his very young age of development. 
And some of the things, if you notice uh, in this room, like the drawings that he has, this room is actually his office when he died a little over 20 years ago. So you can see that he didn't have a computer. He would draw things at two times its actual size so he could get the detail. The paper that he was using was so interesting and he actually drew one gun on one side. He turned the piece of paper over and drew another gun on the other side of his very early guns. His weapon systems were very basic. Timing and luck has a lot to do with it. I, uh, I uh, ran into a individual who was very much like myself that, you know, I could dream up new gadgets and things, but he had an engineering degree, but was in a completely foreign field. And I had to do, uh, I did some work for him on the side and he was impressed. So he said, I've got this new company that I'm going to go to work for as their chief engineer. And he said, uh, I don't have any way of getting you in the engineering department. It had about 25 people or 30 in the engineering department. But he said, can you hold your own in a machine shop, in a specifically a model shop building prototypes? And I says, yeah, I've worked around shops a bit. I think I can. He says, if you can do that, when, you get an, when we get an opportunity, he says, I'll get you in there. So anyway, I worked in this shop for, I think about three years before the opportunity came along. And the fellow was true to his word. And uh, he took me up and introduced me to the head engineer. And the head engineer, which was a, uh, one of the old timer engineers, took one look at me and he knew me because it was you know, a rather small company. And he said, what do you mean taking him up here? He's not a graduate engineer. He said this right in front of me. He says, in fact, his, I don't know what you mean bringing people like this up and expecting me to use them. And so the head man says, well, you're going to. I promised this fellow an opportunity and you're going to do it. So due to the fact that I had a lot of shop experience, it gave me an advantage over almost everybody there because none of them, you know, the engineers are not taught shop in this country. So I had that going for me and I used that up to the hilt. So they put me in a product engineering or production engineering department. And I got quite a bit of experience in there, but it was easy for me because I could see where their problems were coming from, from the shop or interpreting prints or whatever. So I didn't have any trouble with that job at all, but I really wanted to do design work. So I did on my own, I did some design work for them. It turned out to be a whole new line for the company. And the head man was impressed enough. He said, you want to be a designer? And I said, I'm going to get out of this production engineering. He says, okay, you've got it. And he put me underneath the head designer. But the interesting thing on that was that when I went into that department, the guy that said he didn't want me turned out to be the motherly type. If he, he was a teacher by heart and used to spend endless hours with me teaching me how to solve problems engineering-wise that he knew I didn't know how to do them. But he'd take the time and turned out we you know, became very good friends and all. But he was the guy who was very, very blunt, German type. And he said, you know, you can't do it. I won't have you here. And he ended up, we were good friends. And then I uh, got that experience in that company. And luckily, it was a company that had a broad field in aircraft equipment. And uh, I got a chance to do everything the time I was over with and uh, was a designer there for years until I went out on my own and quit. But I know what the problems are and the animosity and everything in there, and it's justified in a lot of cases. I also had the experience of working with graduate engineers that couldn't hold their jobs because they had no mechanical aptitude whatsoever, and they just got in trouble and trouble and trouble, and they, they couldn't design anything. It was just like uh, Dr. Spalding told me, he says, I can help out any engineer design something, but he says, I absolutely can't design anything. He says, I know my limitation, but he says, I can sure help out if you've got a problem. But that was a lucky thing for me. I got that break, you know, quite a few years back. And then once I got established in that thing, nobody ever asked me if I'd graduated from engineering school or not. 
but it, uh, it took some doing. It took a lot of years. And the most valuable thing that I found out was having that shop experience for several years where I had to make a living doing it. He was not a graduate engineer. Gene Stoner went into the military and the Marine Corps. He worked on 50 caliber machine guns during that period of time. I had asked him a couple of times, I said, uh, Gene, I said, with you not having a formal education in engineering, do you think that that, that hurt you any in your career? And he looked at me and he said, you know, Reed, he said, I'm not sure that if I had been a graduate engineer, that I would have tried all the ideas that I had because some of the ideas and thoughts from an engineering standpoint did not look to be feasible. So he kind of felt like that it was a good thing and somewhat of a bad thing. But he did associate himself with different engineers that had different degrees and also engineers that brought something to the table. I had a very interesting talk about this one time to somebody I consider a real expert, and it was a Dr. Spalding that worked for Orlikon, who was a German PhD in uh, mechanics that worked in the gun business all of his life and lived through the whole World War II experience in Germany. And tremendously talented guy. And I said, how do you do it? And uh, you know, the Germans got pretty good at this. and <laughs> in, turning out novel weapons and a lot of them during World War II. He said, well, he said one thing, he said, uh, we brought in, this was at Ehrlichon, and uh, he says, what we did is we brought in a pretty good sized team of Germans after World War II of designers and support people, both in guns and ammunition. And he said, what they did in Germany and what they're doing with the management at Ehrlichon at the time, they don't do that now, but at the time, he said, we want a gun designer. He said, we look for people very carefully wherever they are, whether they're an engineer or in the shop or wherever, to see if they've got this, whatever it is, knack to design mechanical things. They can visualize and design mechanical things and have this talent because we found out a long time ago we couldn't teach it in school. So it just some people have it, some don't, and we don't know why. So we try to find this individual. And according to Spalding, he said, very, very few of their top designers came through schools that were even diploma engineers. He said, very few. He says, maybe one out of 10. And he said, what we found has worked best he says, we find this individual and that has this particular capability. And then he says, to get people like me, I mean, he was a tremendous mathematician and he really knew his kinematics and he had a tremendous you know, years and years of background. I help him out where he needs it. And we get a stress analyst or something and let him help out where he needs it. But he says, we don't let these people get into the detailed ideas and the design. And he said, that seems to work better than any other system, rather than put it in a great big group of people and say, a committee's going to do this. It really is, we have to put an individual that has these, can visualize a system, and then back him up with the talent he needs. Gene was an idea man. He basically would come up with the ideas and he would hand it off to his draftsmen and to his designers and to his engineers. They would do the detail work. Gene never liked to do the detail work. He always said the devil was in the details. He was always interested in going on to the next new thing. Didn't particularly like to test weapons, but when a weapon part broke, he would dig right back in to figure out what it was going to take to fix that piece. So you can see from this very simple room and this very simple drawing board of what he had in his office. He lived just uh, about 30 miles from my factory in Vero Beach, Florida. And he would fly his helicopter up every day to go to work. So we'd land outside and we'd come in and 
we'd work for two or three hours and then we'd, we'd have lunch and then we would come back and about three, four o'clock in the afternoon, he'd fly home. We would have a lot of conversations about where the world was going, what was the next big thing, what should we be doing, how things work, how we could make them better, how we could manufacture them. He went to the tool show with us and looked at different types of manufacturing. I remember one day him making the comment to me, he said, you know, Reed, it sure appears that you have all this new way of manufacturing things. There's probably not much that I can design now that can't be made. He said, but back in the old days with conventional milling machines and conventional machining, that I would design something and it could not be made practically. He understood the laws of physics very well, how it could be made, how it could be made effectively, how it could function. He understood the different things that were a challenge of what could be done and what could not be done. A really down-to-earth engineer. He didn't go way out on a limb. I've got one design where I wouldn't even have tried it 10 years ago because there was no way to cut a cam if you didn't have one of these machines that could to give you three axes of simultaneously. But it was simple once that machine came along and the fellow figured out how to program it, make it just as easy as a straight line. He was one of those type guys that had out of the box thinking. He was one of those type guys that came up with ideas. I did everything from boats to guns to cannons. Потому что целая серия образцов, созданных Джином Стоунером, они хорошо известны во всем мире, и они пользуются, я бы сказал, заслуженным таким уважением. Сделаны они относительно просто, по-оружейному, как бы я сказал. Вот. Это не каждый конструктор, между прочим, так работает. I'm sure that uh, a lot of uh, Eugene Stoner's design uh, and models of his weapons are widely used all over the world, and all over the world they're very highly respected and esteemed. And uh, he believes that uh, it is a unique characteristic of a designer, a unique, well, ability of him that uh, enabled him to create such a good variety of firearms. Later on, I'm going to get into talking about the guns that he designed. Well, I have a lot of stories like that, story about the man. Thank you for listening to what we have to say here at the Institute of Military Technology. Thank you for being here.